America, Disc 4. In bed, one hour later, the lights are out all over the house. We whisper, Did you really have a good time? I had a great time. What made it so great? Being on a farm is great. You get to get up early in the morning and you're outside all day and there are all these animals. I drew a lot of animals. I'll show you my drawings. And we had ice cream every night. Mrs. Mawinney makes it herself. This fresh milk there? All milk is fresh. No, we got it right from the cow. It was still warm. We put it on the stove and we'd boil it and just take the cream off the top and then we'd drink it. You couldn't get sick from it. That's why you boil it. But you don't just drink it right out of the cow. I tried that once, but it doesn't taste so good. It's so creamy. Did you milk a cow? Orrin showed me how to do it. It's hard to do. Orrin would squirt it, and the cats would come around, and they'd try to catch the milk. Did you have any friends? Well, Orrin's my best friend. Orrin Mawinney? Yeah, he's my age. He goes to school there. He works on the farm. He gets up at four o'clock in the morning. He does chores. It's, it's not like us. He goes to school on the bus. It's about 45 minutes on the bus. And then he comes back in the evening and he does some more chores and he does his homework and he goes to bed. He gets up at four o'clock the next morning. It's hard work to be a farmer's son. But they're rich, aren't they? They're pretty rich. How come you talk like that now? Why shouldn't I? That's the way they talk in Kentucky. You should hear Mrs. Mawinney. She's from Georgia. She makes pancakes for breakfast every morning with bacon. Mr. Mawinney smokes his own bacon in a smokehouse. He knows how to. You ate bacon every morning? Every morning. It's delicious. And on Sundays, when we got up, we had pancakes, bacon, and eggs from their own chickens. The, the eggs, they're almost red in the middle. They're so fresh. You go and take them from the chickens and bring them in, and you eat them right there. Did you eat ham? We had ham for dinner about two times a week. Mr. Mawinney makes his own ham. He has a special family recipe. He says if a ham isn't hung up to be aged for a year, he doesn't want to eat it. Did he eat sausage? Yeah, he makes the sausage, too. They grind it in a sausage grinder. We had sausage sometimes instead of bacon. It's good. Pork chops. Oh, they're good, too. They're great. I don't really know why we don't eat it. Because it's stuff from a pig. So what? Why do you think farmers raise pigs? For people to look at them? It's like anything else you eat. You just eat it, and it's really good. You're going to keep eating it now? Sure. It was really hot there, though, huh? During the day. But we'd come in at lunchtime and we'd have tomato and mayonnaise sandwiches with lemonade, with lots of lemonade. We'd rest inside and then we'd go back out into the fields and do whatever we had to do. Weeding. Weed all afternoon. Weed the corn. Weed the tobacco. We had a vegetable garden, me and Orrin, and we'd weed that. We'd work with the hired hands. And there were some Negroes, day laborers. And there's one Negro, Randolph, who is a tenant, and he rose from hired hand. He's a grade A farmer, Mr. Mawinney says. Can you understand when the Negroes talk? Sure. Can you imitate one? They say, backa, for tobacco. They say, I clare. I clare this and I clare that. But they don't talk much. Mostly they work at hog killing time. Mr. Mawinney has Cleet and old Henry who gut the hogs. They're Negroes, they're brothers, and they take the intestines home and eat them fried. Chitterlings. Would you eat that? Do I look like a Negro? Mr. Mawinney says Negroes are starting to move away from the farm because they think they can earn more money in the city. Sometimes old Henry got arrested on Saturday nights for drinking. Mr. Mawinney pays the fine to get him out because he needs him on Monday. Do they have shoes? Some. The kids are barefoot. The Mawinneys give them their clothes when they're done with them, but they were happy. Anybody say anything about anti-Semitism? They don't even think about it, Philip. 
I was the first Jew they ever met. They told me that, but they never said anything mean. It's Kentucky. People there are really friendly. So, are you glad to be home? Sort of. I don't know. You going to go back next year? Sure. What if Mom and Dad won't let you? I'll go anyway. Seemingly, as a direct consequence of Sandy's having eaten bacon, ham, pork chops, and sausage, there was no containing the transformation of our lives. Rabbi Bengelsdorf was coming to dinner. Aunt Evelyn was bringing him. Why, yes, my father said to my mother. Dinner was over. Sandy was on his bed writing to Oren Mawini, and I was alone with him in the living room, intent on seeing how my father was going to take the news now that everything around us was moving at once. She is my sister, said my mother, a touch belligerently. He is her boss. I can't tell her no. I can, he said. You'll do nothing of the sort. Then explain again why we deserve this great honor. The big shot has nothing more pressing than to come here. Evelyn wants him to meet your son. That's ridiculous. Your sister has always been ridiculous. My son is in the eighth grade at Chancellor Avenue School. He spent the summer pulling weeds. This is all ridiculous, Herman. They're coming on Thursday night, and we're going to make them welcome. You may hate him, but he's not nobody. I know that, he said impatiently. That's why I hate him. When he walked about the house now, a copy of PM was constantly in his hands, either rolled up like a weapon, as though he were preparing, if called upon, to go to war himself, or turned back to a page where there was something he wanted to read aloud to my mother. He was perplexed on this particular evening as to why the Germans continued to advance so easily into Russia. And so, rattling the paper in exasperation, he all at once exclaimed, Why don't those Russians fight? They have planes. Why don't they use them? Why doesn't anybody over there put up a fight? Hitler walks into a country, crosses the border, and walks right in. And bingo, it's his. England, he announced, is the only country in Europe to stand up to that dog. He pounds away at those English cities every single night, and they just come back and keep on fighting him with the RAF. Thank God for the men of the RAF. When is Hitler going to invade England, I asked him. Why doesn't he invade England now? That was part of the deal he made with Mr. Lindbergh up in Iceland. Lindbergh wants to be the savior of mankind, my father explained to me, and negotiate the peace that ends the war, and so after Hitler takes Russia... And after he takes the Middle East, and after he takes everything else he could possibly want, Lindbergh will call a phony peace conference, the kind that's right up the Germans' alley. The Germans will be there, and the price for world peace, and no German invasion of Great Britain, will be installing in England an English fascist government, putting a fascist prime minister in Downing Street, and when the English say no, then Hitler will invade, and all with the consent of our president, the peacemaker. Is that what Walter Winchell says, I asked thinking that all he had explained to me was just too smart for him. That's what I say, he told me, and probably that was true. Thank God for Walter Winchell. Without him, we'd be lost. He's the last person left on the radio to speak out against these dirty dogs. It's disgusting. It's worse than disgusting. Slowly but surely, there's nobody in America willing to speak out against Lindbergh's kissing Hitler's behind. What about the Democrats, I asked. Son... Don't ask me about the Democrats. I'm angry enough as it is. My mother had me help her set the table in the dining room on Thursday evening and then sent me to my bedroom to change into my good clothes. Aunt Evelyn and Rabbi Bengelsdorf were to arrive at seven, forty-five minutes later than we would ordinarily have finished eating in the kitchen, but seven was the earliest the rabbi could manage to get to our house because of all his official duties. This was the very traitor whom my father, usually so respectful of the Jewish clergy, had accused aloud of making a stupid, lying speech in behalf of Mr. Lindbergh at Madison Square Garden. The Jewish fake, according to Alvin, who guaranteed Roosevelt's defeat by koshering Lindbergh for the goyim. And so it was puzzling to witness the lengths to which we were going to feed him. I was myself instructed beforehand not to use the fresh towels in the bathroom or to go anywhere near my father's armchair, which was for the rabbi to occupy before we ate dinner. First, we all sat stiffly in the living room while my father offered the rabbi a highball 
or, if he preferred, a shot of schnapps, both of which Bengelsdorf declined in favor of a glass of tap water. Newark has the best drinking water in the world, the rabbi said, and said it as he would say everything, with deep consideration. Graciously, he received the glass, on a coaster, from my mother, whom I could still recall back in October running from the radio in order not to have to hear him praise Lindbergh. You have a most agreeable house, he said to her. Everything in its place, and everything placed perfectly. It bespeaks love of order, which I myself share. I see you have a penchant for the color green. Forest green, said my mother, trying to smile and trying to please, but speaking with difficulty and unable as yet to look his way. You should take great pride in your lovely home. I am honored to be a guest here. The rabbi was quite tall, built on the order of Lindbergh, a thin, bald-headed man in a dark three-piece suit and gleaming black shoes whose erect posture alone seemed to me to express an allegiance to mankind's highest ideals. From the mellifluous southern accent I'd heard on the radio, I had envisioned somebody looking far less severe, but just his eyeglasses were intimidating, in part because they were the owlish oval spectacles that pinched the nose to stay on the face, like the ones that Roosevelt wore, and in part because the very fact that he wore them and examined you through them microscopically made it clear that he was not a man with whom to disagree. Yet, when he spoke, his tone was warm, friendly, even confiding. I kept waiting for him to treat us with contempt or order us around, but all he did was to talk in that accent, which wasn't at all like Sandy's, and so softly that at times you had to hold your breath to hear how learned he was. And you must be the boy, he said to Sandy, who made us all so proud. I'm Sandy, sir, Sandy replied, flushing furiously. It was, to my mind, a brilliant retort to a question that another successful boy, trying to meet the sanctioned standard of modesty, might not have been able to handle with such dispatch. No, nothing could now undo Sandy. Not with those muscles and that sun-bleached hair and the abundance of pig he'd stashed away without asking permission of anyone. And what was it like, the rabbi asked, to work there in the Kentucky fields under the burning sun? He said work for work, and burning for burning, and there for there, and pronounced Kentucky as it was spelled, and not as Sandy now did, as though the first three letters were K-I-N. I learned a lot, sir. I learned a lot about my country. Aunt Evelyn visibly approved, as well she might have, since on the phone the evening before, she fitted him out with the answer to just such a question. Since she had always to be superior to my father, there could be no greater delight than to shape the existence of his oldest son right in front of his nose. You were on a tobacco farm, your Aunt Evelyn tells me. Yes, sir. White burly tobacco. Did you know, Sandy, that tobacco was the economic foundation of the first permanent English settlement in America, at Jamestown, Virginia? I didn't, he admitted, but added, though I'm not surprised to hear it, and in a flash the worst was over. Many mishaps beset the Jamestown pioneers, the rabbi told him, but what saved them from starvation and saved the settlement from extinction was the cultivation of tobacco. Think of it. Without tobacco... The first representative government in the New World would never have met at Jamestown as it did in 1619. Without tobacco, the Jamestown colony would have collapsed, the colonization of Virginia would have failed, and the first families of Virginia, whose wealth derived from their tobacco plantations, would themselves have never come to prominence. And when you remember that the first families of Virginia were the forebears of the Virginia statesmen who were our country's founding fathers, you appreciate tobacco's vital importance to the history of our republic. You do, Sandy answered. I myself, said the rabbi, was born in the American South. I was born 14 years after the tragedy of the Civil War, 
My father was a young man fought for the Confederacy. His father came from Germany to settle in South Carolina in 1850. He was a peddler. He had a horse with a wagon, and he wore a long beard, and he sold to the Negroes and to the white people both. Did you ever hear of Judah Benjamin, the rabbi asked Sandy? No, sir. But again, he quickly righted himself, this time by replying, May I ask who he was? Well, he was a Jew and second only to Jefferson Davis and the government of the Confederacy. He was a Jewish lawyer who served Davis as Attorney General, as Secretary of War, and as Secretary of State. Prior to the secession of the South, he had served in the U.S. Senate as one of South Carolina's two senators. The cause for which the South went to war was neither legal nor moral in my judgment, yet I have always held Judah Benjamin in the highest regard. A Jew was a rarity in America in those days. In the North, no less than in the South, but don't think there wasn't anti-Semitism to contend with back then. Nonetheless, Judah Benjamin came close to the very pinnacle of political success in the Confederate government. After the war was lost, he moved abroad to become a distinguished lawyer in England. Here, my mother removed herself to the kitchen, purportedly to check on the dinner, and Aunt Evelyn said to Sandy, Maybe this is a good time for the rabbi to see the drawings you made on the farm. Sandy got up and carried over to the rabbi's chair the several sketchbooks that he'd filled with drawings during the summer and that he'd been holding in his lap since we all gathered in the living room. The rabbi took one of the books and began slowly turning the pages. Tell the rabbi a little something about each picture, Anne Evelyn suggested. That's the barn, Sandy said. That's where they hang the tobacco to cure after they harvest it. Well, that is a barn, all right, and a beautifully drawn barn. I very much like the pattern of light and dark. You're very talented, Sanford. And that's a tobacco plant growing. That's what they look like. See, it's shaped like a triangle. They're big. That one's still got the blossom on top. It's before they top it. And this tobacco plant, the rabbi said, turning to a new page with a bag on top, that is something I've never seen before. That's how they get the seed. That's a seed plant. They cover the blossom with a paper bag and tie it tight. It keeps the blossom the way they want it. Very, very good, the rabbi said. It isn't easy to draw a plant accurately and still make it into a work of art. Look how you've shadowed the undersides of the leaves. Very good, indeed. And that's a plow, of course, Sandy said. And that's a hoe. That's a hand hoe to do your weeding with, though you can also use just your hands. And did you weed much? The rabbi asked teasingly. Oh, boy, Sandy said, and Rabbi Bengelsdorf smiled, looking not at all like a frightening figure. And that's just the dog, Sandy went on. Orange dog. She's sleeping. And that's one of the Negroes, old Henry, and those are his hands. I, I thought they had character. And who is this? That's old Henry's brother. That's Cleet. I like the way you rendered him. How weary the man looks, slouching like that. I know those Negroes. I grew up with them. And I respect them. And this, what would this be? The rabbi asked. Here, with the bellows. Well, a person's inside. That's how he sprays against tobacco worms. He has to dress like that from head to foot with big gloves and heavy clothes all buttoned up so he doesn't get burned. When he squirts the insecticide out through the bellows, he can burn himself with it. It's green, the dust, and when he's finished, his clothes are covered with it. I tried to get the look of the dust. I tried to make it lighter where the dust is, but I, I don't think it came out right. Well, I'm sure, said the rabbi, that it's hard to draw dust and began to progress a little more rapidly through the remaining pages until he came to the end and closed the book. Kentucky was an experience that wasn't wasted on you, was it, young man? I loved it, Sandy replied, and my father, who had been silent and unmoving on the sofa since yielding the rabbi his favorite chair, got up and said, I have to help Bess, the way he might have said, I'm now going to jump out the window and kill myself. The Jews of America the rabbi told us at dinner, are unlike any other community of Jews in the history of the world. 
they have the greatest opportunity accorded to our people in modern times. The Jews of America can participate fully in the national life of their country. They need no longer dwell apart, a pariah community separated from the rest. All that is required is the courage that your son Sandy displayed by going on his own into the unknown of Kentucky to work for the summer as a farm hand there. I believe that Sandy and the other Jewish boys like him in the Just Folks program should serve as models not only for every Jewish child growing up in this country, but for every Jewish adult. And this is not merely a dream of mine. It is the dream of President Lindbergh. Our ordeal had suddenly taken the worst possible turn. I'd not forgotten how in Washington my father had stood up to the hotel manager and the bullying policeman, and so, now that Lindbergh's name had been spoken with deference in his house, I thought the moment had come when he would stand up to Bengelsdorf. But a rabbi was a rabbi, and he didn't. My mother and Anne Evelyn served the meal, three courses followed by a marble cake freshly baked in our oven that afternoon. We ate off the good dishes with the good silverware, and in the dining room, no less, where we had our best rug and our best furniture and our best linens and where we ourselves ate only on special occasions. From my side of the table, you could see the photographic portraits of the family dead arranged atop the break front that was our memorial shrine. Framed there were two grandfathers, our maternal grandmother, a maternal aunt, and two uncles, one of them Uncle Jack, Alvin's father and my father's beloved older brother. In the aftermath of Rabbi Bengelsdorf's invoking Lindbergh's name, I was more confused than ever. A rabbi was a rabbi, but Alvin, meanwhile, was in a Canadian Army hospital in Montreal learning to walk on an artificial left leg after having lost his own left leg battling Hitler. And in my own house, where I was supposed to wear anything except my good clothes, I had to put on my one tie and my one jacket to impress the very rabbi who helped to elect the president whose friend was Hitler. How could I not be confused when our disgrace and our glory were one and the same. Something essential had been destroyed and lost. We were being coerced to be other than the Americans we were, and yet, by the light of the cut glass chandelier, amid the weighty, dark, stained suite of dining room furniture, we were eating my mother's pot roast in the company of the first famous visitor we had ever entertained. To further confound me and make me pay the full price for my thoughts, Bengelsdorf began all at once to speak about Alvin, whom he learned about from Aunt Evelyn. I am saddened by the casualty in your family. My heart goes out to all of you. Evelyn tells me that when your nephew is released from the hospital, he will come to convalesce with you all. I'm sure you know the mental anguish that such a wound can provoke in someone still in the flower of his youth. It will require all the love and patience you can muster to bring him to where he can again resume a useful life. His story is particularly tragic, because there was no necessity whatsoever for his having crossed over to Canada to join their armed forces. Alvin Roth was born a citizen of the United States, and the United States is not at war with anyone, has no intention of going to war with anyone and doesn't require the sacrifice of life or limb in warfare from a single one of its young men. Some of us have gone to great lengths to make this so. I have encountered considerable hostility from members of the Jewish community for allying myself in the 1940 election with the Lindbergh campaign. But I have been sustained by my abhorrence of war. It is terrible enough that young Alvin should have lost his leg in a battle on the European continent, having nothing to do with the security of America or the well-being of Americans. On he went, more or less repeating what he said at Madison Square Garden in support of America's remaining neutral, but my focus now was only on Alvin. He was coming to stay with us? I looked at my mother. She told us nothing about it. When would he arrive? Where would he sleep? 
It was bad enough, as my mother had said in Washington, that we weren't living in a normal country. Now, we would never again be living in a normal house. A life, even more suffering, was taking shape around me, and I wanted to scream, No! Alvin can't stay here. He has only one leg. I was so upset that it was a while before I realized that the dining room reign of decorum had ended, and my father was no longer allowing himself to be shoved aside. Somehow, he had managed at last to overturn the obstacles posed by Bengelsdorf's credentials and by his own insufficiencies. He had ceased being intimidated by the rabbinical grandeur, and urged on by his irrepressible sense of an impending disaster and violently irritated by the condescension, he was letting Bengelsdorf have it, pince-nez and all. Hitler, I heard him saying, Hitler is not business as usual, Rabbi. This madman is not making a war from a thousand years ago. He is making a war such as no one has ever seen on this planet. He has conquered Europe. He is at war with Russia every night. He bombs London into rubble and kills hundreds of innocent British civilians. He is the worst anti-Semite in history. And yet, his great friend, our president, takes him at his word when Hitler tells him that they have an understanding. Hitler had an understanding with the Russians. Did he keep it? He had an understanding with Chamberlain. Did he keep it? Hitler's goal is to conquer the world, and that includes the United States of America, and since everywhere he goes, he shoots the Jews, when the time is right, he'll come and shoot the Jews here. And what will our president do then? Protect us? Defend us? Our president will not lift a finger. That is the understanding that they reached at Iceland, and any adult who thinks otherwise is crazy. Rabbi Bengelsdorf showed no impatience with my father, but listened respectfully, as if in sympathy with at least some of what he was hearing. Only Sandy seemed to be having trouble keeping his feelings to himself, and when our father referred scornfully to Lindbergh as our president, he turned to me and made a face that revealed how far he'd spun out of the family orbit merely by making the ordinary American's adjustment to the new administration. My mother was seated to my father's right, and when he had finished, gripped his hand in hers though to communicate how proud she was of him or to signal him to be still wasn't clear. As for Aunt Evelyn, she took all her cues from the rabbi, concealing her thoughts behind a mask of benign sufferance while her shallow brother-in-law dared to oppose with his piddling vocabulary a scholar who could talk in ten languages. Bengelsdorf did not immediately respond, but instead created a portentous interval in which quietly to insert his rejoinder. I was at the White House, talking to the President just yesterday morning. Here he sipped from his glass of water, allowing time for us to regain self-possession. I was congratulating him, he continued, on the significant inroad he had made into allaying the Jewish suspiciousness that dated back to his trips to Germany in the late thirties, when he was secretly taking the measure of the German Air Force for the U.S. government. I informed him that any number of my own congregants who had voted for Roosevelt were now his strong supporters, grateful that he had established our neutrality and spared our country the agonies of yet another great war. I told him that just folks and programs like it were beginning to convince the Jews of America that he is anything but their enemy. Admittedly, before his becoming president, he at times made public statements grounded in anti-Semitic clichés. But he spoke from ignorance then, and admits as much today. I am pleased to tell you that it took no more than two or three sessions alone with the president to get him to relinquish his misconceptions and to appreciate the manifold nature of Jewish life in America. This is not an evil man, not in any way. This is a man of enormous native intelligence and great probity, who is rightly celebrated for his personal courage, and who wants now to enlist my aid to help him raise those barriers of ignorance that continue to separate Christian from Jew, and Jew from Christian. Because there is ignorance as well among Jews. Unfortunately, many of whom persist in thinking of President Lindbergh as an American Hitler. 
when they know full well that he is not a dictator who attained power in a putsch, but a democratic leader who came to office through a landslide victory in a fair and free election and who has exhibited not a single inclination toward authoritarian rule. He does not glorify the state at the expense of the individual, but, to the contrary, encourages entrepreneurial individualism and a free enterprise system unencumbered by interference from the federal government. Where is the fascist statism? Where is the fascist thuggery? Where are the Nazi brown shirts and the secret police? When have you observed a single manifestation of fascist anti-Semitism emanating from our government? What Hitler perpetrated on Germany's Jews with the passage in 1935 of the Nuremberg Laws is the absolute antithesis of what President Lindbergh has undertaken to do for America's Jews through the establishment of the Office of American Absorption. The Nuremberg Laws deprived Jews of their civil rights and did everything to exclude them from membership in their nation. What I have encouraged President Lindbergh to do is to initiate programs inviting Jews to enter as far into the national life as they like, a national life that I'm sure you would agree is no less ours to enjoy than anyone else's. A pouring forth of sentences as informed as these had never before occurred at our dining table or probably anywhere on our block. And it was startling then when the rabbi concluded by inquiring rather gently, even intimately, Tell me, Harmon, does what I've explained begin to address your fears? To hear my father respond flatly, No, no, not for a moment. And then... Heedless of rendering an affront that would not only arouse the rabbi's displeasure, but insult his dignity and provoke his vindictive contempt. My father added, Hearing a person like you talk like that, frankly, it alarms me even more. The following evening, Aunt Evelyn phoned and bubblingly informed us that out of the 100 New Jersey boys who had gone west that summer under the sponsorship of Just Folks, Sandy had been selected as the statewide recruiting officer to speak as a veteran to eligible Jewish youngsters and their families about the OAA program's many benefits and to encourage them to apply. Thus did the rabbi extract his revenge. Our father's older son was now an honorary member of the new administration. It was shortly after Sandy began spending his afternoons downtown at Aunt Evelyn's OAA office, that my mother put on her best suit, the tailored gray jacket and skirt with the pale pinstripe that she wore to preside over PTA meetings and as a poll watcher in the school basement at election time, and went off to look for a job. At dinner, she announced that she had found work selling ladies' dresses at Haynes, a big downtown department store. She'd been hired early as holiday help to work six days a week and Wednesday evenings, but as she was an experienced office secretary, she harbored the hope that over the coming weeks, a job might open up on the store's administrative floor and she would be retained after Christmas as a permanent employee. She explained to Sandy and me that her paycheck would contribute toward meeting the larger household bills occasioned by Alvin's return, while her real intention, known to no one other than her husband, was to deposit her paychecks by mail into a Montreal bank account in case we had to flee and start from scratch in Canada. My mother was gone, my brother was gone, and Alvin would soon be on his way home. My father had driven to Montreal to visit him in the army hospital there. One Friday morning, hours before Sandy and I got up for school, my mother made his breakfast, filled his thermos, packed food, three paper bags marked with Sandy's shading crayon, L for lunch, S for snack, D for dinner, and away he headed for the international border 350 miles to the north. Since his boss would give him only the Friday off, he'd have to drive all the way to see Alvin on Saturday and then drive all day Sunday to be back for the morning staff meeting on Monday. He had a flat tire going and two more coming home and to make it to his meeting had to bypass us and drive from the highway directly downtown. By the time we saw him at dinner, He'd been sleepless for over a day and without a proper wash for longer than that. Alvin, he told us, looked like a corpse. 
his weight down to something around a hundred pounds. Hearing this, I wondered how much the leg weighed that he'd lost, and that evening, without success, tried to weigh mine on the bathroom scale. He's got no appetite, my father said. They put food in front of him, and he pushes it away. That boy, tough as he is, doesn't want to live, doesn't want anything except to lie there emaciated with that terrible grim face. I said, Alvin, I've known you since you were born. You're a fighter. You don't give up. You got your father's strength. Your father could take the hardest blow and still keep going. So could your mother. I told him, when your father died, the woman had to bounce back. She had no choice. She had you. But I don't know what sunk in. I hope something he said, his voice growing husky. Because while I was there with all those sick boys in those beds all around me, while I was sitting beside his bed in that hospital, and that was as far as he got. It was the first time I saw my father cry. A childhood milestone when another's tears are more unbearable than one's own. It's because you're so tired, my mother said to him. She got up from a chair and trying to calm him, came around and began to stroke his head. When you finish eating, she said, you'll take a shower and go right to bed. Pressing his skull firmly back into the grip of her hand, he started to sob uncontrollably. They blew his leg off, he told her. And here, my mother motioned for Sandy and me to leave her to comfort him alone. A new life began for me. I'd watch my father fall apart and I would never return to the same childhood. The mother at home was now away all day working for Haynes. The brother on call was now off after school working for Lindbergh. And the father, who defiantly serenaded all those callow cafeteria anti-Semites in Washington, was crying aloud with his mouth wide open, crying like both a baby abandoned and a man being tortured because he was powerless to stop the unforeseen. And as Lindbergh's election couldn't have made clearer to me, the unfolding of the unforeseen was everything. Turned wrong way round, the relentless unforeseen was what we schoolchildren studied as history. Harmless history, where everything unexpected in its own time is chronicled on the page as inevitable. The terror of the unforeseen is what the science of history hides, turning a disaster into an epic. As I was on my own, I began to spend all my after-school hours with Earl Axman, my stamp mentor, and not just to pore over his collection with my magnifying glass or to look through his mother's bureau at her puzzling array of undergarments. Since my homework took no time and my only other chore was setting the table for dinner— I was now wholly available for mischief. And since, in the afternoons, Earl's mother seemed always to be off at the beauty parlor or over in New York shopping, Earl was free to provide it. He was nearly two years older than I, and because his glamorous parents were divorced, and because they were glamorous, he seemed never to have bothered being a model child. Of late, increasingly irritated by being one myself, I'd taken to mumbling in my bed. Now let's do something awful. The suggestion with which Earl alternately thrilled and unnerved me whenever he got tired of what we were up to. Adventurousness was bound to assert its appeal sooner or later, but disillusioned by a sense that my family was slipping away from me right along with my country, I was ready to learn of the liberties a boy from an exemplary household could take when he stopped working to please everyone with his juvenile purity and discovered the guilty enjoyment of secretly acting on his own. What I fell into with Earl was following people. He'd been doing it a couple of times a week for months now, traveling downtown alone after school and hanging around bus stops looking for men on their way home from work. When the one he settled on boarded his bus, Earl climbed aboard too, unobtrusively rode with him until he got off, got off right after him, and then, from a safe distance, followed him home. Why? I asked. To see where they live. But that's all? That's it? That's a lot. I go all over. I even leave Newark. I go 
Any place I want. People live everywhere, Earl explained. How do you get home before your mother? That's the trick. To go as far as I can and get back before she does. The money for the bus fares he readily confessed to stealing from his mother's handbags. And then, as gleefully as if he was springing the lock on the vault at Fort Knox, opened wide a bedroom drawer where all kinds of handbags were piled haphazardly atop one another. On the weekends, when he went to stay with his father in New York, he stole from the pockets of the suits hanging in his father's closet. And when four or five musicians from the Casaloma Orchestra came over to his father's apartment to play poker on Sundays, he helpfully piled their overcoats on the bed, then went through their pockets and hid the change in a dirty sock at the bottom of his suitcase. Then he'd nonchalantly saunter into the living room to watch the card game all afternoon and listen to the funny stories they told about playing at the Paramount and the Essex House and the Glend Island Casino. In 1941, the band had just come back from Hollywood, where they'd been in a movie, and so, between hands, they talked about the stars and what they were like, inside information that Earl passed on to me, and that I then repeated to Sandy, who invariably said, That's bullshit and warned me not to hang around with Earl Axman. Your friend, he told me, knows too much for a little kid. He's got a great stamp collection. Yeah, and he's got a mother, Sandy said, who will go out with anybody. She goes out with men who aren't even her age. How do you know? Everybody on Summit Avenue knows. I don't, I said. Well, he told me, that's not all you don't know. And greatly pleased with myself, I thought... Maybe there's something that you don't know either. But I nervously had to wonder if my best friend's mother wasn't what the older boys called a whore. It turned out to be far easier than I could have believed getting used to stealing from my mother and father, and easier than I would have thought following people, even though the first few times there wasn't a moment that didn't stun me. Beginning with being downtown unwatched at 3.30 in the afternoon... Sometimes we'd go all the way to Penn Station to find someone, sometimes to Broad and Market, sometimes up Market to the courthouse to wait at the bus stop and catch our prey there. We never followed women. They didn't interest us, Earl said. We never followed anybody we thought was Jewish. They didn't interest us. Our curiosity was directed at men, the adult Christian men who worked all day in downtown Newark. Where did they go when they went home? My apprehension was at its worst when we stepped up into the bus and paid. The fare money was stolen. We were where we shouldn't be, and where we were headed, we had no idea. And by the time we got to wherever that was, I was too dizzy with emotion to understand what Earl told me when he whispered the name of the neighborhood into my ear. I was lost, a lost boy. That's what I pretended. What will I eat? Where will I sleep? Will dogs attack me? Will I be arrested and thrown in jail? Will some Christian take me in and adopt me? Or will I wind up being kidnapped like the Lindbergh child? I pretended either that I was lost in some far-off region unknown to me or that, with Lindbergh's connivance, Hitler had invaded America and Earl and I were fleeing the Nazis. And all the while I assailed myself with my fears, we were surreptitiously turning corners and crossing streets and crouching behind trees to stay out of sight until the climactic moment when the man we were following reached his home and we watched him open the door and go in. Then we would stand off at a distance and look at the house, its door once again shut, and Earl would say something like, That lawn's really big. Or, Summer's over. Why are there screens up? Or, See, in the garage? That's the new Pontiac. And then, because trying to sneak up to the windows to peer in unobserved exceeded even Earl Axman's peeping Jewism, he'd lead us back to the bus that would return us to Penn Station. Often at that hour, with everyone busy leaving work, the bus headed back downtown would be empty of passengers other than us. And so it was as though the driver were a chauffeur and the public service bus our private limousine, and the two of us, the most daring two boys alive. Earl was an extremely well-fed, white-skinned ten-year-old, already a bit of a vat, with full, babyish cheeks, 
and long, dark lashes, and tight black ringlets perfumed with his father's hair oil. And if the bus was empty, he would stretch himself out on the long rear seat in a pasha-like posture, perfectly embodying his swaggering mood. While sitting up beside him, lean and bony, I sported the half-ashamed little sidekick smile of sublimity. From Penn Station, we'd catch the number 14 home, taking our fourth bold bus ride of the afternoon. At dinner, I'd think, I followed a Christian, and nobody knows. I could have been kidnapped, and nobody knows. Using the money we've got between us, we could have, if we wanted, and would sometimes all but give myself away to my sharp-eyed mother, because beneath the kitchen table, and exactly like Earl when he was cooking up something, I couldn't stop jiggling my knee. And night after night I went to sleep under the exciting spell of the great new aim I'd unearthed for my eight-year-old life, to escape it. When at school I heard a bus through the open window climbing the Chancellor Avenue Hill, all I could think about was being on board. The whole of the outside world had become a bus. The way for a boy in South Dakota, it was a pony. The pony that carries him to the limits of permissible flight. I joined Earl as apprentice liar and thief in late October, and with no dwindling of the sense of momentousness, our secret jaunts continued as the weather grew colder in November and then on into December, when the Christmas decorations went up downtown and there was an excess of men to choose from at just about every bus stop. Christmas trees were for sale right on the downtown sidewalks, something I'd never seen before, and selling the trees for a buck apiece were kids who looked to be either hardship cases or toughs recently released from reform school. Money changing hands like that out in the open struck me, at first, as against the law, and yet nobody appeared concerned with concealing the transaction. There were cops in profusion, cops with nightsticks walking the beat in their large blue overcoats, but they looked happy enough and seemed to be in on it. In on Christmas, that is. Big, wind-driven blizzards had been whipping in twice a week since just after Thanksgiving, and so to either side of the freshly cleared streets, grimy hillocks of snow were already banked as high as a car. Unimpeded by the late afternoon throngs, the vendors rested one tree free from the others, carried it a ways onto the busy sidewalk, and propped it on its sawed-off trunk to be sized up by the customer. It was strange to see trees grown by some tree farmer miles from the city massed along the wrought iron railings out front of the city's oldest churches and leaning in piles against the facades of the imposing banks and insurance buildings. And strange, too, on a downtown street to breathe in their rustic tang. There were no trees for sale in our neighborhood, because there was no one to buy them. And so the month of December, if it smelled at all, smelled of something a hissing alley cat had tugged from an overturned garbage can in somebody's yard, and of supper heating on the stove of a flat whose steamy kitchen window was open a crack to let in the air from the alleyway, and of the bursts of noxious coal gas spewed from the furnished chimneys, and of the pail of ashes dragged up from the cellar to be emptied outdoors over slippery patches of sidewalk. Compared with the fragrances of North Jersey's damp spring and swampy summer and unsettled moody fall, the smells of a bitter cold winter were almost unnoticeable. Or so I was convinced until I traveled downtown with Earl and saw the trees and took a whiff and discovered that, as with many things, for Christians, December was otherwise. What with all of downtown strung with thousands of bulbs and the carolers singing and the Salvation Army band reveling and on every street corner another Santa Claus laughing, it was the month of the year when the heart of my birthplace was sublimely theirs and theirs alone. In Military Park, there was a decorated Christmas tree 40 feet tall, and from the face of the public service building hung a giant metal Christmas tree illuminated by floodlights that the Newark News said was 80 feet tall, while I was barely four and a half feet tall. My final trip with Earl occurred one afternoon a few days before our Christmas vacation, when we boarded the Linden bus behind a man who was carrying in either hand a department store shopping bag stuffed with gifts and decorated for the season in red and green. Just ten days later, Mrs. Axman would suffer a nervous breakdown and be taken away in an ambulance in the middle of the night. And soon after that... 
On New Year's Day, 1942, Earl would be whisked off by his father, stamp collection and all. A movie's truck showed up later in January, and while I watched, took all the household furnishings away, including the bureau with Earl's mother's underwear, and no one on Summit Avenue saw the Axemans again. Because the cold winter twilight now descended so quickly, following people home from the bus made us feel all the more satisfied with ourselves, as though we were about our business long after midnight, when other kids had been asleep for hours. The man with the shopping bag stayed on the bus past the hillside line and over into Elizabeth, and got off just past the big cemetery, not far from the corner where my mother had grown up, above her father's grocery store. We got off after him quietly enough, the two of us looking indistinguishable from a thousand other local school kids in the standard-issue winter camouflage of hooded mackinaw and thick woolen mittens and shapeless corduroy trousers tucked into ill-fitting rubber galoshes with half of their maddening toggles undone. But because we imagined ourselves more concealed than we were by the deepening shadows, or because our adroitness was losing its power to time, we must have tailed him less skillfully than we were practiced at doing, and thus compromised the invincible duo, as Earl had vaingloriously dubbed the pair of Christian trackers we'd become. There were two long blocks to traverse, both of them lined with stately brick houses, bright with Christmas lights, that Earl identified in a whisper as millionaires' mansions. Then there were two shorter blocks of much smaller, modest frame houses of the kind that by then we'd seen by the hundreds on the streets that we'd traveled, each with the Christmas wreath on the door. On the second of the two blocks, the man turned onto a narrow brick pathway that curved up to a low shoebox of a shingled house that poked up prettily out of the bank snow like the edible adornment on a big frosted cake. Lamps were burning dimly upstairs and down, and the Christmas tree could be seen twinkling through one of the windows to the side of the front door. While the man set down his shopping bags to get his keys out, we drew closer and closer to the undulating white lawn until, through the window, we were able to discern the ornaments decorating the tree. Look, Earl whispered. See the top? At the very top of the tree, see that? It's Jesus. No, it's an angel. What do you think Jesus is? I whispered back. I thought he was their god and chief of the angels. And there he is. This, then, was the culmination of our quest. Jesus Christ, who by their reasoning was everything, and who by my reasoning had fucked everything up. Because if it weren't for Christ, there wouldn't be Christians. And if it weren't for Christians, there wouldn't be anti-Semitism. And if it weren't for anti-Semitism, there wouldn't be Hitler. And if it weren't for Hitler, Lindbergh would never be president. And if Lindbergh weren't president, suddenly... The man we followed, standing now in the open doorway with his shopping bags, twirled around and softly, as though exhaling a smoke ring, called, Boys, so flabbergasted were we by being caught that I, for one, felt summoned to step forward onto the path leading up to the house and, like the model child I'd been two months before, clear my conscience by telling him my name. Only Earl's arm held me back. Boys, don't hide. You don't have to the man said. What now? I whispered to Earl. Shh! He whispered back. Boys, I know you're there. Boys, it's getting awfully dark, he warned in a friendly voice. Aren't you freezing out there? Wouldn't you like a nice cup of cocoa? Inside now. Children, quickly. Inside now before it snows. There's hot cocoa, and I have spice cake, and I have seed cake, and gingerbread men. I have animal crackers frosted in all different colors. And there are marshmallows. There are marshmallows, boys. Marshmallows in the cupboard that we can toast over a fire. When I again looked at Earl to find out what to do, he was already on his way back to Newark. Run for it, he shouted at me over his shoulder. Beat it, Phil! It's a fairy! Chapter 4 January 1942 to February 1942 the stump. Alvin was discharged in January 1942, after forsaking first the wheelchair and then the crutches and, over the course of a long hospital rehabilitation, 
having been trained by the Canadian Army nurses to walk unassisted on his artificial limb. He would be receiving a monthly disability pension from the Canadian government of $125, a little more than half of what my father earned each month from the Metropolitan, and an additional $300 in separation pay. As a handicapped veteran, he was eligible for further benefits should he choose to remain in Canada, where foreign volunteers into the Canadian Armed Forces, if they wished, were granted citizenship immediately upon discharge. And why didn't he become a Canuck? asked Uncle Monty. Since he couldn't stand America anyway, why didn't he just stay up there and cash in? Monty was the most overbearing of my uncles, which probably accounted for why he was also the richest. He'd made his fortune wholesaling fruit and vegetables down near the railroad tracks at the Miller Street Market. Alvin's father, Uncle Jack, had begun the business and taken in Monty, and after Uncle Jack died, Monty had taken in his youngest brother, my Uncle Herbie, when he invited my father in as well. When my parents were penniless newlyweds, my father said no, having already been sufficiently bullied by Monty while they were growing up. My father could keep pace with Monty's prodigious expenditure of energy, and his capacity to endure all manner of hardship was no less remarkable than Monty's. But he knew from the clashes of boyhood that he was no match for the innovator who first gambled on bringing ripe tomatoes to Newark in the wintertime by buying up carloads of green tomatoes from Cuba and ripening them in specially heated rooms on the creaky second floor of his Miller Street warehouse. When they were ready, Monty packed them four to a box, got top dollar, and was known thereafter as the Tomato King. While we remained rent-paying tenants in a five-room second-story flat in Newark, the uncles in the wholesale produce business lived in the Jewish section of suburban Maplewood, where each owned a large, white, shuttered colonial with a green lawn out front and a polished Cadillac in the garage. For good or bad, the exalted egoism of an Abe Steinheim or an Uncle Monty or a Rabbi Bengelsdorf, conspicuously dynamic Jews, all seemingly propelled by their embattled status as the offspring of greenhorns to play the biggest role that they could commandeer as American men, was not in the makeup of my father. Nor was there the slightest longing for supremacy. And so, though personal pride was a driving force, and his blend of fortitude and combativeness was heavily fueled, like theirs, by the grievances attending his origins as an impoverished kid, other kids called a kike, it was enough for him to make something, rather than everything, of himself, and to do so without wrecking the lives around him. My father was born to contend, but also to protect and to inflict damage on an enemy didn't make his spirit soar as it did his older brothers, not to mention all the rest of the brutal entrepreneurial machers. They were the bosses, and they were the bossed. And the bosses usually were bosses for a reason, and in business for themselves for a reason, whether the business was construction or produce or the rabbinet or the rackets. It was the best they could come up with to remain unobstructed and, in their own eyes, unhumiliated not least by the discrimination of the Protestant hierarchy that kept 99% of the Jews employed by the dominant corporations uncomplainingly in their place. If Jack was alive, Monty said, the kid wouldn't have got out the front door. You should never have let him go, Herm. He runs away to Canada to become a war hero, and this is where it lands him. Goddamn gimp for the rest of his life. It was the Sunday before the Saturday of Alvin's return, and Uncle Monty was leaning against our kitchen sink, a cigarette dangling out of his mouth and wearing clean clothes instead of the badly stained windbreaker and splattered old pants and filthy cloth cap that were his usual market attire. My mother was not present. She had excused herself, as she generally did when Monty was around. But I was a small boy and mesmerized by him, as though he were indeed the gorilla that she privately called him when her exasperation with his coarseness got the upper hand. Alvin can't bear your president my father replied. That's why he went to Canada. Not so long ago, you couldn't bear the man either. But now this anti-Semite is your friend. The depression is over, all you rich Jews tell me, and thanks not to Roosevelt, but to Mr. Lindbergh. The stock market is up, profits are up, business is booming, and why? Because we have Lindbergh's peace instead of Roosevelt's war. And what else matters? What besides money counts with you people? You sound like Alvin, Herman. 
You sound like a kid. What counts besides money? Your two boys count. You want Sandy to come home one day like Alvin? You want Phil, he said, looking over to where I sat listening at the kitchen table, to come home one day like Alvin? We're out of the war, and we're staying out of the war. Lindbergh's done me no harm that I can see. I expected my father to respond, Just you wait. But probably because I was there and frightened enough already, he didn't. As soon as Monty left, my father told me, Your uncle doesn't use his head. Coming home like Alvin, that's not something that's going to happen. But what if Roosevelt is president again? Then there would be a war, I said. Maybe and maybe not, my father replied. Nobody can predict that in advance. But if, if there was a war, I said, and if Sandy was old enough, then he would be drafted to fight in the war. And if he fought in the war, then what happened to Alvin could happen to him. Son, anything can happen to anyone, my father told me. But it usually doesn't. Except when it does, I thought but I didn't dare say as much because he was already upset by my questions and might not even know how to answer if I kept on going. Since what Uncle Monty said to him about Lindbergh was exactly what Rabbi Benkelsdorf had told him, and also what Sandy was secretly saying to me, I began to wonder if my father knew what he was talking about. It was close to a year after Lindbergh took office that Alvin returned to Newark on an overnight train from Montreal, accompanied by a Canadian Red Cross nurse and missing half of one of the legs that he'd left with. We drove downtown to Penn Station to meet him, as we did to meet Sandy the summer before, only this time Sandy was with us. A few weeks earlier, in the interest of family harmony, I'd been allowed to go off with Aunt Evelyn and him to sit in the audience and listen as he impressed the congregation of a synagogue some 40 miles south of Newark in New Brunswick, encouraging them to enroll their children in just folks with stories of his Kentucky adventure and an exhibition of his drawings. My parents had made it clear to me that Sandy's job with just folks was something I needn't mention to Alvin. They'd themselves explain everything, but only after Alvin had a chance to get used to being home and could better understand how America had changed since he'd gone to Canada. It was a matter not of hiding anything from Alvin or of lying to him, but of protecting him from whatever could interfere with his recovery. The Montreal train was late that morning, and to pass the time, and because the political situation was with him now every moment of the day, my father had bought a copy of the Daily News. Seated on a bench at Penn Station, he scanned the paper, a right-wing New York tabloid that he unfailingly referred to as a rag, while the rest of us paced the platform, anxiously waiting for the next phase of our new life to begin. When the PA system announced that the Montreal train would be arriving even later than expected, my mother, linking arms with Sandy and me, walked us back to the bench to wait there together. My father had, meanwhile, finished as much of the daily news as he could bear and thrown it into a trash basket. Since ours was a household where nickels and dimes mattered, I was as perplexed to see him discard the paper only minutes after buying it as I'd been to see him reading it in the first place. Can you believe these people, he said? This fascist dog is still their hero. What he didn't say was that by making good on his campaign promise to keep America out of the worldwide war, the fascist dog had by now become the hero of virtually every paper in the country, with the exception of PM. Well, said my mother as the train finally entered the station and began to pull to a stop, here comes your cousin. What should we do? I asked her, as she prompted us onto our feet, and the four of us stepped toward the platform's edge. Say hello, it's Alvin. Welcome him home. What about his leg? I whispered. What about it, dear? I shrugged. Here, my father took me by the shoulders. Don't be afraid, he said to me. Don't be afraid of Alvin, and don't be afraid of his leg. Let him see how you've grown up. It was Sandy who broke away from us and went racing toward the car that had come to a halt a couple of hundred feet down the track. Alvin was being pushed from the train in a wheelchair by a woman in a Red Cross uniform while the person who was barreling down on him, shouting his name was the only one of us who'd been won over to the other side. I didn't know any longer what to make of my brother, but then I didn't know what to make of myself. So busy was I trying to remember to conceal everyone's secrets while doing my best to suppress my fears and trying not to stop believing in my father, as well as in the Democrats and FDR and whoever else could keep me from teaming up with the rest of the country and adoring President Lindbergh. You're back, Sandy cried. You're home. And then I watched as my brother, 
who'd only just turned 14 but was as strong now as a young man of 20, dropped to his knees on the platform's concrete floor, the better to be able to throw his arms around Alvin's neck. My mother began crying then, and my father quickly took me by the hand, either to try to prevent me from going to pieces or to protect himself from his own chaos of feelings. I thought it must be my job to run to Alvin next, and so I pulled away from my parents and broke for the wheelchair and, once there, imitating Sandy, threw my arms around him, only to discover how rotten he smelled. I thought at first that the smell must be coming from his leg, but it was coming from his mouth. I held my breath and shut my eyes and only released my hold on Alvin when I felt him lean forward in the chair to shake my father's hand. I noticed then the wooden crutches strapped to one side of the wheelchair and for the first time dared to look straight at him. I'd never before seen anyone so skeletal or so dejected. His eyes showed no fear, however, or any trace of weeping, and they surveyed my father with ferocity, as though it were the guardian who had committed the unpardonable act that had rendered the ward a cripple. Herman, he said, but that was all. You're here, my father said. You're home. We're taking you home. Then my mother bent forward to kiss him. Aunt Bess, Alvin said. The left trouser leg dropped straight down from the knee, a sight generally familiar to adults, but one that startled me. Even though I already knew of a man with no legs at all, a man who began at the hips and was himself no more than a stump. I'd seen him before begging on the sidewalk outside my father's downtown office, but overwhelmed as I was by the colossal freakishness, I'd never had to think about it much since there was never any danger of his coming to live in our house. He did best with his begging in baseball season when, as the men working there left the building at the end of the day, he would run through the afternoon's final scores in his incongruously deep declamatory voice, and each of them would drop a couple of coins into the battered laundry pail that was his alms box. He moved about on, appeared, in fact, to live on, a small platform of plywood fitted beneath with roller skates. Aside from my remembering the heavy, weather-beaten work gloves he wore all year round, to protect the hands that were his means of ambulation. I'm unable to describe the rest of his outfit because the fear of gaping merged with the terror of seeing to prevent me from ever looking long enough to register what he wore. That he dressed at all seemed as miraculous as that he was somehow able to urinate and defecate, let alone remember the ball scores. Whenever I came along to the empty insurance office on a Saturday morning with my father largely for the delight of twirling in his desk chair while he attended to the week's mail, he and the stump of a man would always greet each other with a friendly nod. I discovered then that the grotesque injustice of a man's being halved had not merely happened, which was incomprehensible enough, but that it had happened to someone called Robert, as commonplace as a male name could be, and six letters long, like my own. "'How you doing, little Robert?' my father said as we two passed together into the building. How are you, Herman? Little Robert would reply. Eventually I asked my father, Does he have a last name? Do you? my father asked me. Yes. Well, so does he. What is it? Little Robert what? I asked. My father thought a moment, then laughed and said, To tell you the truth, son, I don't know. From the moment I found out that Alvin was returning to Newark to convalesce in our house, I would involuntarily envision Robert on his platform and wearing his work gloves whenever I lay stiffly in the dark trying to force myself asleep. First my stamps covered with swastikas, then little Robert, the living stump. I thought you'd be up on the leg they gave you. I thought they couldn't discharge you otherwise, I heard my father saying to Alvin. What happened? Without bothering to look at him, Alvin snapped. Stump broke down. What's that mean? my father asked. It's nothing. Don't worry about it. Does he have luggage? my father asked the nurse. But before she could answer, Alvin said, Sure, I got luggage. What do you think my leg is? Sandy and I were headed for the baggage counter on the main concourse, with Alvin and his nurse, while my father hurried off to get the car from the Raymond Boulevard lot, accompanied by my mother, who went along with him at the last minute, more than likely to talk over all they hadn't anticipated about Alvin's mental state. Out on the platform, the nurse had summoned a red cap, and together they helped Alvin to a standing position, and then the red cap took charge of the wheelchair, 
while the nurse walked at Alvin's side as he hopped to the head of the escalator. There, she took up her place as a human shield, and he hopped after her, clutching the moving banister as the escalator descended. Sandy and I stood at Alvin's back, out of range at last of his unfragrant breath, and where Sandy instinctively braced himself to catch him should Alvin lose his balance. The red cap, carrying upside down and over his head the wheelchair with the crutches still strapped to one side, took the stairs parallel to the escalator and was already on the main concourse to greet us when Alvin hopped from the escalator and we stepped off behind him. The red cap placed the wheelchair right side up on the concourse floor and firmly positioned it for Alvin to sit back down. But Alvin turned on his one foot and began to hop vigorously away, leaving his nurse, to whom he'd said neither thank you nor goodbye, to watch him speed off along the crowded marble floor in the direction of the baggage room. Can't he fall? Sandy asked the nurse. He's going so fast. What if he slips and falls? Him? The nurse replied. That boy can hop anywhere. That boy can hop a very long way. He won't fall. He's the world champion hopper. He'd have been happier to hop from Montreal than to have me helping him down here by train. She then confided to us, two protected children entirely ignorant of the bitterness of loss. I've seen them angry before, she said. I've seen the ones without any limbs angry, but nobody before ever angry like him. Angry at what? Sandy asked anxiously. She was a strapping woman with stern gray eyes and hair short as a soldier's under her gray red cross cap. But it was in the softest maternal tones, with a gentleness that came as yet another of the day's surprises, as though Sandy were one of her very own charges that she explained, at what people get angry at, at how things turn out. My mother and I had to take the bus home because there wasn't enough room in the little family Studebaker. Alvin's wheelchair went into the trunk, though, as it was the old, unwieldy, uncollapsible type, the lid of the trunk had to be tied shut with heavy twine to accommodate it. His canvas overseas bag, with the artificial legs somewhere inside, was stuffed so full that Sandy was unable to lift it even with my help, and we had to drag it across the concourse floor and through the door to the street. There, my father took charge, and he and Sandy laid it flat out across the back seat. Practically doubled over at the waist, Sandy was perched atop the bag for the ride home, Alvin's crutches straddling his lap. The crutches' rubber cap tips protruded from one of the rear side windows, and my father tied his pocket handkerchief around the ends to warn off other drivers. My father and Alvin rode up front, and I was unhappily preparing to squeeze between them just to the right of the floor shift when my mother said she wanted my company on the ride home. What she wanted, it turned out, was to prevent me from having to witness any more of the misery. It's okay, she said, as we headed around the corner for the underpass where the line formed for the 14 bus. It's perfectly natural to be upset. We all are. I denied being in any way upset, but found myself looking around the bus stop for somebody to follow. Easily, a dozen different routes started out from this one Penn Station stop, and it happened that a Valesburg bus bound for distant North Newark was taking on passengers at the very moment that my mother and I stood at the curbside of the underpass, waiting for a 14 to show up. I spotted just the man to follow, a businessman with a briefcase who seemed to me with my admittedly imperfect grasp of the telling characteristics that Earl was so masterfully attuned to, not to be Jewish. Yet, I could only look with longing as the bus door closed behind him, and he rode off without my spying on him from a nearby seat. This ends Disc 4.